are so excited that you're here. Um, in case you wondered about the music, it didn't happen. So if you thought you missed that, you didn't. That's good news. And uh, uh, I offered to play the guitar if Red would sing, and uh, I didn't know the song that he was going to sing, so that's, that's how that went. Um, as you know, as you know, we have, uh, over the last month, we've allowed... <laughs> We invited uh, our students to, to share a word with us on Wednesday night, and we've had um, four good uh, messages that they've shared with us. And, you know, that whole part is in preparation for the, God, for the call that God has placed on their life. And, uh, and we're going to tonight, I guess will be our last night, as, as Vicar uh, came to us two weeks ago. as a visitor, and uh, we began recruiting him that day. <laughs> uh, we took him to Chili's, found out that was his favorite, and so we took him back to Chili's over and over and over, took him golfing several times, and uh, anyway, we finally, we won, or or they lost, I don't know, but <laughs> been a great blessing to us, not just to us, but to our, our youth ministry and just to our leadership team. So I just want to invite you to open your hearts. And uh, just just hear what God has for you. Um, normally, he would have about 30 minutes, but he's going to have to make it last 45 minutes. So so he, he can take his full liberty. So before he comes up, let's pray, and then I'm just going to invite Vikram to make himself at home. Father God, we do love you. Master, our heart's desire is for you. God, we just ask that you would first, that you would tender our hearts, that we would... Um, be available to be changed by your word. God, that you would uh, bless Vikram as he comes, that um, he would decrease and you would increase, that Christ would truly show through. We trust you to that end. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can you hear me? Is this working? So I tried to milk the whole chilies and um, golf thing as long as I could. I decided eight months was probably enough, but they, I got a lot of chilies and golf out of that. It was awesome. So a couple things before I get started. One, they call this microphone flesh-colored. I, I, it's, it's a little offensive. <laughs> it's, it's more like contrast-colored for me, but it's okay. Um, also, when I first got dressed to come up here, um, I was wearing shorts, and my wife, Alana, who puts up with a lot, looked at me like, you're putting pants on, right? And I said, I just kind of looked at her like, and she said, but you're preaching. I was like, but it's the refuge. I can, I can get away with that. And she said, listen, if Brian can wear sleeves to preach, <laughs> you can wear pants today. So <laughs> I put on pants, and here I am. So... Thanks so much for letting me do this tonight. It's, uh, it's a big honor for me to be up here. Um, I think Mike, Travis, and Alan are brave or dumb or something for letting the four of us come up here. I, I think if you look at um, Sergio, Brian, Red, and myself, we, we're, we might be the most unlikely group of pastors in the state of Texas. But um, they trust us for whatever reason, and, and so we're going to try to— and, I, and the guys have done a great job, and I'm a little nervous following them, but— um, I'll do my best. And so I wanted to say that I've never been more proud um, to be a part of a community than I am at the refuge. Um, we've been a lot of places. I, I grew up at a Christian school, worked at a church, or served at a church for a few years before this. And being here the past two years, is, I think, is the best thing that could have ever happened to Alana and I. Um, uh, I kind of dragged her here kicking and screaming at first, but uh, we've both just fallen in love with this place, and um, we're so grateful for all of you, and I'm so grateful that you're here tonight. We, we brag on you constantly. I talk about this place constantly, so I'm just proud to be a part of the refuge, and I'm proud of all of you. Um, I've been doing this for a little while now. I guess the, the minister, pastor thing, about eight years. I uh, worked with youth. I've worked with college students, and now I'm back working with youth, and I tend to repeat myself after a while. You know, I, I, 
I don't know, I guess I'd run out of material and go back in the files for old stuff. So if any of the youth have heard this before, I'm sorry. I'm not really sure they listen to me anyway when I talk. I, I kind of get this look <laughs> a lot. And so, not Sarah's offended. I'm sorry, Sarah. Yeah, she listens to me. Um, but <laughs> Jeremy listens. He, he sheepishly raised his hand like, me too. Um, but so if you've heard this before, I'm sorry. But th where's Jeff? Where's Jeff sitting? Jeff at first said he was going to sit in the front row and heckle me a little bit or um, make funny faces at me or just stare at me. But I'm glad you're here, Jeff, because th this sermon's for you tonight. <laughs> because we're talking about boats. And Jeff, if you didn't know, is our resident boat expert. Now he's going to heckle me. He's giving me the dirtiest look. I don't know if you can see his face right now. Um, we're really going to be talking about being used by God and letting God use you. But in the Bible, a lot of the imagery they go to and a lot of the examples they use is about boats. Uh, they lived around the Mediterranean. The riders were all in that area. A lot of them were fishermen. So boats and fishing and that kind of stuff was something they were very intimately aware of, intimately connected with. And so not necessarily for Jeff's benefit, but we are going to talk a little bit about boats. So I'm going to read for you out of Luke 5. Um, the Bible talks about the calling of the first disciples. So this is Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put a, out a little ways from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. <clears throat> Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the son of, sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Do you remember being called by God? And, and make no mistake, we're all called by God. Uh, you may not be called to get up here and put on an off-colored microphone and talk to a whole bunch of people on a Wednesday night, but we're all called by God to minister wherever we are, in whatever communities we belong to, whether it's at your job or just to people out on the street. Anyone you meet, we're called to be ministers, and so we've all been called, called by God. And I think that looks different for everyone, and it feels different from everyone, or for everyone. It doesn't always all come at once. I, I think we feel like a call should be more like a phone call where we pick it up and we answer it, and then it's over, you hang up, and you get to go on with your day. But the call keeps coming. It's like, have you ever not paid a bill for a while? Or tried not to come serve with Travis and Alan at a church? Uh, your phone will ring a lot. You get to go to Chili's a lot. But you're, well, not if, you're, not if you're in debt. But um, if you're dealing with them, you get to go to Chili's a lot. But the call keeps coming. And I, I remember two things pretty clearly about my call from God. Um, first, it was when I really started to fall in love with God when I really started to figure out who Jesus was as a person, not just academically, not just the Jesus I, I guess, read about in the Bible, but the Jesus that I knew and who walked with me. I also remember that I went kicking and screaming, and I was just so unhappy about the whole concept of being called by God. It really didn't make my day. I, was, I wasn't pleased. Um, so it was in college, I guess. Uh, a little bit about my background. I, I Grew up here in Lubbock, went to a Christian school, Alana and I both, we've known each other since the first grade, we grew up together. Um, and so for years and years, throughout high school, throughout elementary school, as long as I can remember, we've had God fed to us. Um, we were told, this is who God is, this is what he looks like, uh, this is how you should pray, this is how you should act, this is what you should, how you should do. And then we got out of high school and realized that in college, nobody was constantly feeding that to us. It wasn't something that was always right there in front of us. It was something that we had to seek, and I didn't. 
Um, I, I don't know that I really did anything to um, hurt my relationship with God. I, I don't know that I really went as wild as some people that, that find freedom, with, which I very easily could have. Um, but Alana did a great job of keeping me grounded. She was, um, she was a great influence on me, and she kept me where I needed to be. Um, but at the same time, I wasn't really doing anything to get closer to God. I think we went to church when we came into town. Um, I, you know, we may, where we were in College Station, we maybe went to church four or five times in five years. And so it wasn't something that was a part of my life. Until when I was 19 years old in my sophomore year of college, um, a guy named Nolan, who was the youth minister at a church in town called Redwood Baptist, called me up. He'd met Alana and I once, twice before this, and said, we're having a weekend event, a disciple now with our students. Will you come and lead a small group? Um, now, we'd been involved with that throughout, throughout high school. Uh, Alana has a lot more experience with church than I did at that point, so I'd gone once, and, but I'd never led a group like that. I'd never been a part of something like that. And we said, okay, why not? It'll be an excuse to drive home, and we'll get to you know, see our families and, and hang out for a weekend. And so we went through this and led a small group, and it was terrifying and rough and uncomfortable and really hard, and I was totally hooked. Totally hooked. Um, some people jump out of airplanes. I would need a new pair of shorts, and I would cry all the way down, cry all the way to the ground, just certain that I was going to die the entire time. And it's, it would be worse because there'd be someone strapped to my back making fun of me the whole way down. <laughs> but I got my rush from getting to tell people about God, this God who I'd started to meet and started to get to know. And from then on, it kind of developed where any time we'd be in town, we'd go on Wednesday nights and hang out with the youth group or... Um, We'd come in and help with events or whatever like that. There wasn't a whole lot of pressure on us. We got to be involved when we were around, and then we didn't have to be when we were away. And even when we were here, we had this covering of Nolan who put everything together, who was in charge, and we just got to help. 2010, about oh, September, October, Nolan calls and says, hey, will you come, come over? I want to talk to you about something. I says, okay, sure. I pull up, and... Uh, his lawn was mowed and his hedges were trimmed. And I was like, that's not right. He doesn't go outside. This is really strange. There, you know, this, shouldn't be, this shouldn't be happening. And I walk up to the door and there's one of those cool little electronic boxes that the real estate agents put on people's doors when they're trying to move. And I was like, that's weird. Why would that be there? And apparently I'm dense. Still wasn't getting it. I walked in and half of their house is already packed up. And he said, I've taken a job in New Mexico. I'm moving on to a church there. Um, would you like to take over the ministry for me? I don't know if you've ever laughed in the face of a good friend, um, but the look of hurt is really a little bit alarming when you, when you laugh at them and say, not only no, but heck no. And he was really upset. He didn't, he didn't want to hear that answer, but that was the answer I gave him. And I think I laughed about halfway home, and then God started to deal with me. And we kind of did business. And by the time I pulled up to the house, I told my wife, hey, I think we're going to be taking over a... Um, youth ministry. Has your wife ever given you a really angry look? Just, just this horrible, like really, she got over it too, and she kind of got into it. And so uh, we, from that point on, we led youth ministry for a while. We did college ministry, and then we ended up here. The call kept coming. It kept coming over and over again. Um, I want this. You need to do this. It doesn't go away. If anything, the call gets more uncomfortable. It gets harder. You have to go farther with this call that God gives you. And it's interesting because we didn't plan this, but watching back, and I missed a couple of the, the guys' um, messages. I've been out of town a lot. But we all kind of talked about the same thing, how God got a hold of us, how God called us to more. And we didn't plan that, but I think it's on all of our hearts because we're going through this course of studies and we're learning more about ministry and learning more about God, and it becomes very relevant. It, become, it, it drags it up close to the surface. So in verses 1 through 3 in this passage, it's really pretty easy. This call is really pretty easy. Jesus comes up. These guys are there cleaning off their nets, just hanging out on the shore, and he says, let me get in your boat, and let's go out there, and I'm going to talk to all these folks. Okay, not so hard, right? All you do is you go, and you anchor the boat, and you hang out, and you let this guy talk. And then it grows from there. It grows from there. God is always calling us into deeper water. Verse 4 says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water. Put out in the deep waters. 
and let down the nets for a catch. He's always calling us farther. He's always calling us deeper. I think out of a desire for us to grow, out of a desire to perfect us and make us better and make us stronger and make us um, better tools for him to use. He always calls us deeper and he always calls us farther. Um, I think it's his, really his means of perfecting us. But then we run into this issue where it really, we really find out what we need and we find out what we have as we go into our call. Uh, Verse five says, Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night. We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. So Peter shows a little bit of faith here. He complains a little bit. Imagine him saying, really? Really, we've been out there for hours and hours and nothing happened. Do you see any fish? But fine, you're telling us to do it, we'll go do it. So then I I guess when I read this passage, I kind of question, what did Peter really have? What did Simon Peter really have? Uh, He was a fisherman at this time. They were, I mean, it was grunt work. He probably wasn't especially well educated. Uh, He probably didn't spend a whole lot of time in the temples, wasn't what a lot of people would call holy or a good Christian now or a churchman, you know, whatever whatever we want to call it. He He wasn't polished. He was rough around the edges. He was a fisherman. He was just a, you know, a working guy. I dug holes for a year and a half for a living, and, and I, I feel Peter. I moved rocks, and I dug holes, and uh, landscaping's hard work if you've never done it, but it's very rewarding, too, and I imagine it was for Peter, too. So what Peter had was a lot of trial and error. He'd been out there all night fishing, all, the, all night trying to catch fish, and it hadn't worked. He'd learned, I think, pretty effectively what didn't work. And you understand, he's a fisherman that couldn't catch any fish. That's like me calling myself a golfer. I can swing a club. I can hit a little white ball, but I've almost killed Travis more than once tra- with, a, with a golf ball. He's back there nodding. I think he's having flashbacks. I remember one time he and Jim were in the cart, um, and they were sitting in a cart, and I, I, you know, and so the words you should never say when you're playing golf is there, there's no way I'm going to hit that guy. Never say it. So he's off to the left. He's around some hills, and I shank it halfway to New Mexico, and I see them both dive out of the cart, and it apparently went right between them. So I'm not a good golfer, but I like to call myself a golfer sometimes. I I guess just to stroke my ego a little bit. So he's a fisherman that hadn't been catching any fish. Really, all Peter had to offer Jesus was his empty boat. He had an empty boat. That's it. He had some nets, I guess, but he and his buddies had some empty boats. That's really all it was. Um, There's a story in in Matthew 19, um, verses 16 through 22, about, and, and the Bible calls this uh, Jesus counseling the rich young ruler. Um, so in verse 16, it says, Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, so Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but, but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness, excuse me, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You notice the two, there's a couple that Jesus leaves out when he reads the commandments to him. He mentions, don't stab people, don't commit adultery, don't steal, it's bad. Um, Don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. No, that's a good one. A couple he leaves out are, um, have no other God before me. Make no idols. He leaves those out because he knows this guy, and he knows that this guy is doing fine on all the other ones. He's not a mass murderer. He doesn't run around hitting people with clubs and stuff. He's, he's not a liar. He's not a thief. But the things he couldn't keep and the things he couldn't measure up to were having no other gods before God and making no idols. He was too in love with what he had. He was too in love with his money in this case, but I think we can call it with our ambitions, our agendas, our ideas. Um, he was too caught up in what he had to really commit and leave that all behind and follow Jesus. Um, and so he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He, he went away sad. Jesus offered him life. He offered him the chance to walk with the creator of the universe. And he said, no, I like what I've got going on a little too much. 
I'm, I'm happy where I am. I'm just going to go back. I'll be sad for a little while, but I'll probably get over it because I can ride my 15,000 gold-plated camel. I don't, I don't know. Um, if you feel like God isn't using you, and believe me, I felt that way myself, maybe you need to look at how you're trying to be used. Um, Travis talks about this a lot, how we try to fit our... Um, we try to fit our plans into what God's going to do, or try to fit God into our plans and try to cram him in there. And, and I think that that's something that I'm definitely guilty of. Uh, it's something I've done time and time again. I remember when we were doing college ministry, um, we had a nice little group. We were doing great. We had, you know, several students coming, just sitting down and talking, getting to know each other. And I got the idea in my head that I could do this better. This could be way better. We could have the biggest, apparently I've never been to First Baptist, but I was like, we could have the biggest college ministry in Lubbock. We need a set of drums, Jeff. So back to Jeff. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jeff. Uh, we need a set of drums, and we need speakers, and we need some lights, and a bigger place to meet. And oh my gosh, if I had a budget, we could do well with ministry. We could, we could do what was right. If I had some money to work with, then we could do it. And I remember one Wednesday after we moved down into our new room and I bought a set of drums and some speakers and some microphones and had a couple of my students leading worship and all kinds of stuff. I remember a Wednesday night when I was playing something. I was up there helping lead worship. And these two kids were singing and Alana was running the PowerPoint. And this one kid named Daniel was sitting in the audience. And it was Daniel. It was just Daniel. Daniel was happy to be there. He was clapping and singing along, and he was having a great time, but it was just Daniel. And I remember God saying to me, what are you doing? What is it that you think you're doing? Do you think you can give them something better with a set of cheapo electric drums that I can't give them with my word, with, with real community? So we went back to just sitting around and, and talking about the Bible, and from nowhere, students started coming back. And more than that, I, I didn't really care about how many people were there, is that we actually, we figured out how to get closer to God. We started to walk with Jesus. We started to get into it. And so we fill our boats up. I filled my boats up with, or I filled my boat up with, uh, you know, $50 sound mixers and speakers and drums and a kid named Daniel. And really what I needed was less. And, and, and I guess I risk saying this a little bit since I'm going through ministry classes and we're studying a whole bunch, and then Mike's giving me a look, but you, you, we, we don't need more. We don't need more. We need more Jesus. Um, you know, I could have the best plan for building a better church. You know, I could build a better mousetrap. I could have the, the 10 steps to the highly effective Christian, and, and ministry 101, and sermon writing for dummies, and when it comes down to it, if I'm not filling my boat with Jesus, what does it matter? What am I doing? I'm not doing anything right. I'm out there fishing, I'm throwing my nets, and I'm not catching anything. Daniel's still hanging around clapping, but that's all there is. That's all there is. And so if we can get out of our own way, if we can get out of God's way and not make our ministries what we're making of them, um, God can actually push his agenda instead of us trying to push hers. Ours. Hers. I don't know. Um, push hours, and then God can do what he wants. Um, and the problem is that we do get our, in our own way. The problem is that a lot of times we're our own worst critics. I, I know I am my worst critic, and Alana's back there grinning at me, but I am so hard on myself, and I get in my own, own way constantly, constantly. It's all I do. Um, and we need to give ourselves a break. We need to give ourselves a little bit of a break. Because we start to convince ourselves that as we are, God can't use us. With what we're doing and, and the things we've done and the skill set we have, we convince ourselves that we're no good to God, that we're no good to each other. We're no good uh, to our family, to our friends, to the people we're ministering to. Um, we, we don't believe God when he tells us he can use us. We think we know better than him about what he needs and what he can use. Um, and we end up using our own shortcomings and our own brokenness as a crutch. We walk around with a crutch of our own brokenness and, and put it up as a wall between us and our ministries and between, and between us and God. Um, in verses 6 through 10, uh, it says, When they had done so, so when they had gone out and cast their nets back out, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. 
So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. Uh, that, that's a lot of fish. Boats don't like to sink. Boats like to float. That's what boats do. If you're a boat, your job in life is to float and not sink when you have fish on you. Um, so that's a lot of fish. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and Simon's partners. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Um, we're so much like Peter. We call ourselves unworthy constantly. In a lot of times, even in the name of humility, we say, in, in order to feel humble, the Bible says we should be humble. In order to be humble, I need to talk about myself like I'm no good. When I think humility really is the ability to let God use the gifts we have, and to use the gifts we have for his glory instead of for our own. Um, if you're a guitar player, if you're Jordan up here playing the guitar, be the best you can be. Practice all you can. Um, be, and I, and I, I don't take my own advice. I, you know, I look at, you know, I'm trying to stay two steps ahead and figure out what note to play next on, on the bass over here. And we should be using our gifts as much as we can for God. We should be doing what we can for God, because I think that's real humility, saying that, yeah, I can do this, but it's not for me. It's not for my own benefit. It's for your benefit. Um, Peter thinks he's unworthy. I think Peter is a little bit scared of success. I think Peter is terrified of success, because he sees what Jesus has done. He sees the amount of fish that Jesus could catch doing something that he couldn't do. Um, I've spent a large portion of my life trying my best to hang out in the middle of the pack, academically with, with whatever else. Um, when, I, when I started to get, I played tennis in high school, and when I started to get good, I quit. I did. Um, because it was easier and it was less uncomfortable to hang out in the middle of the pack. Leading's hard. There's a burden of leadership. And if you're out in front of people and you're the best at something, they will consistently expect you to be the best at that. If they know that you're capable of something, they will expect you to be capable of it. And so, so succeeding and leading is so hard and it's so terrifying. And my parents are sitting back here, and uh, you know, I know this was a, a source of contention for them throughout high school when I'd come home and I'd be like, yes, B minus, and they'd just look at me like, come on, it's freshman English, you can do better than that. Um, even in the college, until I figured out that getting into ministry, I had to lead, that I had to figure out how to let myself excel at what I was doing, how middle of the pack, just getting by wasn't okay anymore. And I think the problem is that a lot of times we get scared and we don't think we can measure up, that if I put myself out in front, if I put myself um, where I'm really being used, where my ministry is really going somewhere, that someday everyone will figure out that I can't measure up, that, that Jesus will figure out that I can't measure up. And it's terrifying. It's so scary. Um, and it's, it was easier just not to accept responsibility for being good. So when Peter falls down on his face, now, again, this boat is so full of fish that it's sinking, and Peter falls on his face. So I imagine him laying there in a big pile of fish, getting slapped in the face and stuff, telling Jesus that he's a sinful man and to go away. Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Um, he's telling this Jesus, who just filled up his boat with fish, that he and his boat weren't big enough, weren't strong enough, and weren't good enough for him. That what he could offer wasn't enough. Even though Jesus had just filled it out. And his boat started sinking. I think that's an important uh, to point out is that Jesus put this burden on him and he filled him up and Peter got scared because his boat started to sink. He didn't trust that they weren't going to drown. He didn't trust that Jesus was going to walk him through it, that since he was there, he would be okay. Whatever happened, he would be okay. And then here's Jesus's response in verse 10. I think it's one of the most beautiful pieces of scripture I've read. And it's real simple. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, um, you, we will fish, from now on, you will fish for people. Um, I think Jesus is telling him, yeah, you may be right, you know, 
you can't do all of this by yourself. You couldn't catch all these fish on your own. You couldn't. But don't worry. Don't be scared of that. You're exactly what I need. I think he's telling Peter, you are what I need. He's telling Peter, despite your shortcomings, despite your lack of education, despite the fact that you're a fisherman who can't catch fish, you're exactly what I need because you have this empty boat. You have a boat that I could get on and use as a platform to speak. You have a boat that I could go and catch fish from. You have a boat I can use. You're empty. What you have is empty, and I can fill it up. And so I can be more through you. And uh, it turns out that people don't need perfect from us. The people we minister to, the people we meet, the people we love on, they don't need uh, perfect for us. They need people. They need real people. They need to see that we can bear up and that we can struggle with something and still come out the other side okay. They need to see our example. And in a lot of ways, I think our brokenness is where we're strongest. And I think in our emptiness and our brokenness is where we can really do the most to minister to a broken world. Because they can see that you are empty and here's what God did through you. Here's how God filled you up and here's how God's using you now. And that's the message we need to be sending. Again, not that I'm empty and that I'm broken, but that I'm empty and I'm broken and God, look what God's doing through me anyway. Here's the skill set that I have or don't have, and it didn't even matter because God's doing so much through me. And so if we can empty out our boats and we can really commit um, to letting Jesus drive, to letting him sail a little bit, and letting him tell us where to cast our nets, then success shouldn't scare us. Because I think the God that can fill your, your boat up so full with fish, so full of... Um, love, of life, of friends, of whatever else, is the same God that can keep your boat from sinking. He might let you get close. You remember when Peter got out of the boat and walked on water? Peter sunk like a rock. I think that's why Jesus called him the rock, because he knew he was going to sink. But Jesus was right there to pick him up, and he didn't let him drown. He let him stumble, but he didn't let him drown. Um, Finally, I think that, and I'll sort of end with this, I think that if we really want to be used by God, if we really want to be used in our ministries, and again, I'm saying ministries because we're all ministry, um, we have to accept the sacrifice that we have to make. We have to accept the sacrifice that comes with it. Um, In verse 10, it says, I'm sorry, verse 11. um, So, okay, I'll start back in verse 10. Um, then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. If anyone ever tries to tell you ministry is easy, I want you to punch him right in the nose. Right? Don't, don't do that. Or at least don't tell them that I told you to do that. Um, ministry's tough. And, and I'm going to be real honest and real transparent with you. It is the hardest thing I think I've ever done. It really is. Uh, it's a study in... Um, uh, w- one of my favorite, I guess, youth pastors who I look up to is, is a guy out of California named Mark Iaconelli. And he said that youth ministry is a study in failure, frustration, and loss. How it's, it, it's, a, it's a constant battle of dealing with failure, dealing with not being good enough, dealing with frustration, dealing with this expression. You know, of people not getting what you're saying. I think that Jesus dealt with that too. If you read his, his interactions with the disciples, I, I imagine Jesus is constantly like, oh, my, they still don't get it. They still, they've asked me the same question three times and they still don't get it. I've told them six parables that mean the same thing and they don't get it. And, and it's frustrating sometimes and it's hard and it's our spiritual discipline. It makes us, ministry in general, forget youth ministry, ministry in general, Loving on people like God would makes us trust God. Because we quickly figure out we've got no idea what we're doing. No idea. That we're, we're out of our depth, we're in over our heads, and that the only way we're not going to sink like Peter is, is for, for Jesus to take us by the hand and to walk us through our ministries. Um, it requires sacrifice. And, and I think some, a part of this story that um, gets left by the, by the side a lot of times is that these guys, yeah, they'd gone through this where their boat started to sink, their nets started to break. In verse 10, it said they left everything and followed him. They had just caught the catch of fish of a life, lifetime. This was their life's ambition. This is their life's work to be fishermen. And they'd spent, they'd gone from catching no fish at all 
to having the biggest catch. Obviously it is. They were scared. They had so many fish that they were terrified. Biggest catch of their lifetime. And they left it on the beach and they followed Jesus. Uh, an interesting thought that I hadn't had, you know, uh, someone pointed it out to me, was that there were a whole crowd of people following Jesus. So maybe by leaving all these fish there, he was providing for them. They'd been following him around. They were probably hungry. Jesus is always providing for more than you see in a situation. Um, God blesses people through you in ways you don't understand. Um, I don't know if that ever dawned on the disciples. It might have. They may have realized, hey, by leaving these five bazillion fish here, these guys can eat. I don't think they do, because later on, when Jesus is pulling fish out of a basket, they're like, there's not enough fish. Come on. They still don't get it. Again, Jesus does the same thing over and over, and they still don't get it. Um, And I think our God isn't one who lets us be comfortable and complacent. I think if we're really following, we shouldn't be comfortable and complacent. They could have been very comfortable cashing in their big catch of fish, being like, man, that was cool. Thanks, Jesus. That was great. And then going back to their fishing career and going back to that same spot over and over and over again where Jesus had them let down their nets and they caught all these fish. Um, With the idea that it happened once, maybe it'll happen again. But they didn't. They left everything they followed him so that he could lead them into deeper waters. He could continue to lead them into deeper waters and into deeper facets of their ministry and into the love of God and the power of God. Um, So he's not a God of comfort and complacency. I think he's a God of adventure, um, of danger, and of righteousness. He's He's not a tame God. And I've heard people say that, you know, in the beginning, God created us in his image, and we've been returning the favor ever since. We, we make for ourselves this warm little fuzzy God that we can pull out on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and then put back on the shelf and leave around, who's comfortable, who's safe, and who fits in our picture of who God should be. But he's not that. He's so much more than that. He's constantly trying to make us into his image. That's, it shouldn't be the other way around. And... Um, if you don't know this, I'm a giant nerd. I'm a big nerd. Just, I, like, I like Lord of the Rings and knights and superheroes and hobbits. Hobbits are awesome. Big furry feet. Um, so I'm going to close with a, a little story from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite writers. Uh, if you've never read anything by C.S. Lewis, uh, he was a brilliant man. Brilliant man. Um, uh, certifiably a genius. Um, led philosophical discussions with uh, Tolkien. He was good friends. He was in a book club, in a coffee club with J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings and other authors of his time. He actually um, was an atheist for years and years and couldn't reconcile the world he saw around him um, with the lack of a good God, a good and loving God. And so, um, powerful man, brilliant man. Um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is about animals and children and stuff, and it's... uh, you know, they're, they're largely kids' books, but they're so deep. There's so much there. So if you don't know the story, um, it's about these four kids. At least this one book is about these four kids who get kind of accidentally, through a whole bunch of shenanigans, uh, thrown into this magical world called, called Narnia. Okay? And they're there, and they meet this lion. And, or they, hear, they start hearing about this lion. And, and li- the lion, Aslan, in the story is um, the Jesus character. He's, he's, he represents Christ in this story, and he's the one that defeats evil. He um, battles for good. He kind of fades away throughout the series, but he's still there, but people don't know to look for him anymore or don't look for him anymore. They lose sight of him, and things start to degrade, and they start to get him back. And so really the story, the series as a whole, is this progression of these kids finding out what good actually is and what good looks like and how good can be used and how they can serve this, this Aslan and be good in his eyes. Um, and so in the, in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, they've just stumbled into Narnia. They see a lamppost. There's snow and dudes with, you know, goat legs and all kinds of weird stuff. And they're hanging out with a family of beavers and badgers, and the, these beavers and badgers are talking to them. So that should have been their first clue that something wasn't quite right, that um, this weird little woodland creature was talking to them. But they start to talk about this lion. They start to talk about Aslan. And the beavers start to tell them a little bit about Aslan. And uh, uh, Mr. Beaver says, because it's Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, that's about, I think, as creative as he wanted to get with that particular storyline. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion, 
Oh, said Susan. Susan's the, the older girl in the story. Um, I thought he was a man. Is he safe? I think I'd feel nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good and he's the king. We forget that just like Aslan in the story, this, this lion isn't safe, that our Jesus, our God is not safe. And he doesn't call us to safety. Um, these kids throughout the story go into battle and they're, you know, they're children fighting wars. And um, in our lives, we are children of God fighting wars. That's what we do. We fight for the lives and the souls of people. Um, not with swords and bows and arrows, but with love and with the words of Christ and the power of God. And so, no, we're not called to safety. We're not called to be comfortable um, because Jesus isn't safe. He isn't comfortable, but he is good, and he is the king. So um, if you'll stand with me, we'll pray, and uh, we'll be done just a couple of minutes early. God, we want to be good. Um, don't let us sit in our comfort and our complacency. Don't let us fill up our boats with the things that we don't need. Um, let us have less. Let us be less so that you can be more. Um, God, we love you so much, and, and we want to know who you are, and we want to walk closer with you constantly. We want to be what you would have us be, not, not so we can say, look how good we are, but we can point to the one who is good and who is king. Um, Father, I pray as we go from this place that you just keep us safe and keep us, um, keep us strong, keep us bold, and um, let us know that regardless of where we are, what we're doing, that you're there with us, that you're this lion that's prowling behind us and, and the source of our strength, Father. Uh, God, let it rain. Um, let it rain, and uh, send us your blessings, Father. We love you so much. In your name, amen.